Okay, commissioners, um, we are going to get started. I would like to call this meeting to order. This uh, It's 2.35. Um, and I will proceed with uh, a roll call. Uh, commissioners, please, after um, each one of you hear your name, please reply with here uh, or present. Um, and please confirm that you can see me and, and hear me. Um, Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Hughes. I will come back to you. Uh, Commissioner Djakovic. Here, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Osman. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Ponce. Hello, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Commissioner Hughes. Present, I can see and hear you. Thank you, commissioners. Um, last year, Governor Pritzker signed Public Act uh, 101640, making certain amendments to the Open and Meetings Act. So we have, um, so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings to this, during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that Chairman Wong of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks can determine that an in-person meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks and its permit review uh, committee are not practical or prudent. I want to make sure our virtual meeting um, meets all these conditions, uh, all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, Chairman Wong has made a determination pursuant to Section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of this Commission on Chicago Landmarks and its Permit Review Committee is not practical or prudent. Similarly, he has um, he also determined pursuant to Section 7E5 that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officers to be physically present at the meeting place for either meeting um, in as much as there is no physical meeting place. Pursuant to a resolution adopted by the Chicago, uh, by the Commission on Chicago Landmarks on June 4th, 2020, regarding the chairman's emergency rule making powers, Chairman Wong issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and provisions for remote public participation effective January 19, 2021. These rules were posted on the commission's website. In line with this emergency rules, today's regular commission meeting is a virtual meeting being um, simulcast to the general public via live streaming. Commission meetings have been held virtually since May of last year. Meetings are structured to minimize the chances for technical difficulties. Members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written statements in advance of the meetings. And these have been posted on the commission's website and are available for public view during the virtual meeting. Uh, at www.chicago.gov slash CCL. Members of the public desiring to speak at today's meeting were required to register before the meeting and verbal statements by the public oral agenda items will take place at the beginning of the meeting. Applicants and their representatives as well as aldermen were asked to contact staff if they desire to speak and they will be able to do after the staff presentation on a specific project. Today, five members of the general public has signed, uh, signed up to speak um, as of the deadline of 12.45 p.m. on Tuesday, August 3rd, and were provided with instructions regarding on how to do so. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes. Begin by stating uh, your name and the association you represent, if any, for the record. We will begin with agenda item one, the project at 1060 West Addison, May I, uh, may we please hear from um, Mary Lou Seidel. Mary Lou, are you there? Thank you, yes I am, thanks. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Commissioner Aguirre and the rest of the uh, Permit Review Committee of the Ch Commission on Chicago Landmarks. As a preservation advocate and a lifelong Cub fan, I encourage the commission today and going forward to take the greatest of care when considering adaptations and alterations at Wrigley Field. 
Childhood experiences at that ballpark are some of my fondest memories. I especially cherish taking my nephew to games when I was old enough. Picture two kids, 12 and six, taking a bus and paying $1.50 for tickets. That's the most surprising memory. Getting to the park early to watch batting practice and try to convince Yvonne De Jesus, Steve Onaveras, and Dave Kingman to autograph our scorecards. Fun fact, I did cherish that Yvonne De Jesus autograph for many years. I have been visiting Wrigley Field regularly, inside and out, since the early 1970s. In the last 10 years, there have been significant changes that individually have passed review, but are collectively starting to have a substantive impact on Wrigley Field's history as a ballpark, one that is adjacent to the L platform, which I also enjoyed watching games from when I was waiting for my train, and amidst a wonderful neighborhood full of historic structures. While I'm required to speak at the beginning of this meeting before being able to see the renderings for the plan, I urge the commission to walk gingerly around further modifications that may contribute to the death by a thousand bites, which so often befall even the most cherished historic places. It is hard enough to filter out two large jumbotrons which sit on either side of the historic manual scoreboard. Please don't leave us with a ballpark that requires us to wear some some significant blinders to really enjoy the history of Wrigley Field. While I suspect the Ricketts family would wish you would lighten up on your reviews, baseball fans worldwide thank you for the work you do to keep the second oldest ballpark in America as close to its original form as modern needs can accommodate. Thank you for the, your consideration of this testimony. Uh, thank you, Ms. Idell. Um, now I would like to hear from um, those people who sign up to speak regarding agenda item number two, uh, the project at 1054 West Oakdale. Maybe, um, may we please hear from uh, Tone Martin? Hi, you actually have um, Laura Martin because Tone's having uh, some internet issues. Is that okay? Uh, yes, please proceed. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is, yeah, my name's Laura Martin. You can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So my husband and I are 10 year residents of 1048 West Oakdale. We're very cognizant of what is and has been allowed during the rehabilitation of our landmark district. With the 1054 resident, when the 1054 residence was purchased, we had high hopes it'd be restored to its deserved landmark status. What is currently proposed, even after being scaled back from previous plans, does not meet the city's ordinance for the landmark district. A review of the original landmark committee's recommendation from 2004 and subsequent city ordinances bring up two key issues. With the proposed project, many architectural elements will be replaced with different material, which goes against the guidance of the Secretary of Interior Standards. For example, the 2004 report states the front steps that are currently concrete would, were of wood origin. Now the proposal is for stone. Currently covered attic window elements noted in the 2004 report are now proposed to be, are not proposed to be restored. Most of all, the wood elements are prevalently referenced throughout the final landmark committee's report. It makes no sense that the approach now being taken is that the builder will be allowed to replace materials with stone unless demolition shows that anything different was used. Nothing hints that the materials being proposed are historically accurate, let alone provable. If the same landmark committee bound us from changing the front porch steps at 1048 West Oakdale from wood to stone, how could the same restrictions not be enforced on the 1054 project? Number two, the proposed alteration of 1054 Oakdale ignores the city council landmarks ordinance protection of all exterior elevations and roof lines visible from the public way. For, um, I'm gonna skip what this says because you guys have the thing and I'm running out of time. Um, but it specifically says, Based on the elevation of Terracotta Row, the commission recommends that significant features include all exterior elevations, including roof lines of the four principal structures and three associated coach houses that are visible from the public way. Simply, the whole entirety of the proposed alterations are visible from Oakdale and Seminary. The proposed second floor alteration will be completely visible from Oakdale as it sits 40 feet unobstructed from the right of way. Removing the late 80s edition should be an effort to restore it to landmark form. It should not be free license to destroy the protected elevation and roof line. The proposed north edition will be completely visible from the seminary public way, which again changes the protected elevation and roof line. On both streets currently visible, protected terracotta elements will be demolished for the proposed alteration. 
Public way, visible roof lines, and exterior elevations on both streets will be altered beyond repair. That the houses on a corner had no consideration when the ordinance protecting elevations and roof lines was approved by the city council. As one of the stewards of Terracotta Row, we ask you to enforce the city's ordinance and continue to protect the integrity of our district. There's a little bit more in my letter, but I cut it short for time. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Martin. Um, now we would like to hear from those people who sign up to speak regarding agenda item uh, number four, the project at 2107 North Cleveland. Um, may, may we please hear from uh, War Miller. Um, Madam Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Uh, dear Madam Chairman and members of the Permit Review Committee, I'm Ward Miller, Executive Director of Preservation Chicago. We at Preservation Chicago are opposed to the proposed new construction of a two-story masonry single family residence with detached garage to be located at 2107 North Cleveland in the Mid-North Landmark District. The one-story masonry commercial building once located at the site and considered to be a contributing building in the Mid-North District collapsed under somewhat murky circumstances in the past year and perhaps without the proper permitting. This was a source of several news stories and created some outrage both in the community and with the aldermen at the time of the building's collapse. There was talk of hefty penalties for this loss and perhaps even suggestion of, suggestions of an undermining of a historic building on site. With all of this noted, the idea of proposing a new building, which is residential versus a commercial structure, and not pursuing a reconstruction of the one-story historic structure appears to us to be a dangerous precedent under these circumstances. At a minimum, the volumes, the overall facade design and framework of the historic one-story structure should be reconstructed with some of the many materials that were said uh, in this very meeting, said to be salvaged and presented to this commission and committee earlier this year. That reconstruction should follow the same forms and volumes and could include a rooftop addition if so desired, but set back according to the rules, regulations, and standards of the commission. We, however, at Preservation Chicago feel that this proposal, as outlined in the draft agenda of the Permit Review Committee, does not fit Landmark's criteria. And if the building cannot be replaced in kind, other structures uh, that have come before the commission um, uh, in the past uh, have remained vacant for a number of years, uh, uh, along with penalties. Uh, numerous historic one-story garages and ancillary buildings in other, several other landmark districts, very similar in scale to this uh, building, have been ordered to be reconstructed under this committee and commission in the past. So we want to encourage um, the Landmarks Ordinance uh, remain in place for this uh, historic building and uh, that it accommodate uh, a reconstruction of this building with the materials said to have been salvaged, uh, give the overall look and uh, look at a long-term moratorium uh, if those standards could not be met. And such moratoriums were instituted for the Work Dexter building in the South Loop a number of years ago. Um, and that has remained a vacant site since. So we really want to encourage um, or discourage, if you will, an undermining of the landmark ordinance. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, I see Alderman Tooney is with us today and has uh, raised his hand. Um, Alderman Tooney, would you like to make a statement now, would you like, I know there are two of the projects that are in our agenda are corresponding to your word. Would you like to make a statement now? Would you like to make a statement after each one of the projects? Uh, what would be your, your preference? We have one more- Chairwoman, Chairwoman. Yes. Chairwoman, I will wait until and make a comment after each presentation that is in the 44th Ward, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, we will um, make sure to call you after those two presentations are um, done. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, now we, we have one more speaker. Uh, now, uh, can we please hear from Melissa Masik? Hi there, my name is Josh Glazer and uh, uh, Melissa Machek is out of uh, town. Uh, she is the president of Mid North. I'm the zoning chair and she's asked me to uh, step in for her. Uh, Mid North, as you may know, has been uh, a vital participant in Chicago's uh, 
uh, landmark district, the Mid-North Landmark District for almost 40 years. Um, and I would like to uh, build upon Mr. Miller's uh, comments. Um, I, I, uh, I live on the street and I was personally there for, <laughs> to witness and uh, the uh, aftermath of the un unfortunate uh, collapse of the North Wall of uh, the old 27, 2107 North Cleveland. Um, uh, from my understanding, the uh, uh, prior owners had uh, uh, been had done some unauthorized work in the basement, and once it became clear that uh, there was significant damage to the building, they fought very, very hard. Uh, the, the, the damage was done because the uh, uh, the the land underlying the building is 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 sand is just really predominantly sand. And when they were building down and in attempting to increase the size of their basement, the uh, uh, the north wall collapsed. Um, uh, Mid North is concerned about uh, a couple of different items. Number one, uh, we would echo uh, Mr. Miller's uh, desire that there's a kind of a visual permeability uh, for the site. Uh, uh, number two, uh, we see the. The, the zone, the request for the zoning reduction, and I know that this is not the zoning meeting, but uh, uh, this, the, the, in any case, the reduction of the setbacks that are being uh, requested would um, would risk, uh, given the underlying sandy conditions, would risk a, a further damage uh, damage to the uh, buildings to the east and west of this. I'm sorry, to the north and south of this building. And um, uh, we don't want, uh, no, no matter what precautions might be taken from a structural standpoint, uh, we don't want to uh, risk, and we think it's an unreasonable risk to, to, to dig down to the point where the adjacent buildings could be damaged. Um, in some cases, uh, just as in this case, uh, the land was more valuable than the building. And if a, a neighbor's building is under, uh, is structurally damaged, they may, uh, without a lot of argument, have a, have a good argument that, that would say that they would be able to tear down their building too um, and build something new from scratch. And the buildings next door are historically significant. Thank you very much for your uh, time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Poitier. Uh, this is all the speakers who sign up to speak for the permit review committee meeting. Uh, so now we will go through the agenda. Um, the next item in the agenda is the approval of the minutes of our previous meeting held on um, the regular meeting on July 1st of 2021. Commissioners, as a reminder, when you wish to speak, make a motion or a second motion, please press the raise hand function on the panelist window at the right of your um, on the right side of your screen and I will call upon you. Could I please request a motion to approve the minutes of the July 1st uh, meeting? So moved, Commissioner Hughes. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, may I request a second motion? Second, Commissioner Ponce. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Uh, now I'm gonna take a vote, uh, Commissioner Jakovic. Yes. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Osman. Yes. And myself, Commissioner Aguirre also vote yes. So the motion carries uh, unanimously and the minutes will be posted on the commission's website. Um, now we're gonna proceed with um, item uh, number one, um, the uh, 1060 West Addison um, on Wrigley Field proposed construction of a new two-story triangular addition with roof depth at the southwest corner, southeast corner of the stadium. Um, I would like to call Larry to make his presentation. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Aguirre. Uh, in 2013, the Permit Review Committee approved a restoration and expansion plan for Wrigley Field, which was implemented in five phases at the end of each baseball season. Uh, the approval included a two-story addition at the southeast corner of Wrigley Field, known as the Mini Triangle Parcel, and this was replacing the Captain Morgan Club, which had been constructed in 1990 and was connected to the exterior of the grandstand. 
In 2018, the Cubs notified staff that the previously approved two-story triangle-shaped addition was to be eliminated from the project. Now the owner wishes to construct a similar two-story addition at the same location and has submitted pre-permit plans for committee review. They're also reviewing this design with the National Park Service and that review is ongoing. Uh, we have received a letter of support from Alderman Tunney. Uh, it didn't arrive in time to go out with the packet, but it has been posted on the commission website. And obviously the, uh, the Alderman is, um, is here uh, as well. So this is the aerial image of the um, stadium, just to give you a little bit of orientation. Addison is here at the bottom, Sheffield on the right and Clark Street on the left. And where that red arrow was shown is where the uh, triangle building is proposed. Uh, and then here are some current photos, uh, mainly taken from Addison, showing the south elevation of the stadium. Uh, and then the images on the lower right uh, show some of the more contemporary additions uh, along Sheffield. Uh, this slide includes renderings of that proposed triangle building uh, that was approved back in 2013, those two upper images, and then the revised mini triangle building uh, shown on the uh, bottom two images. So as I mentioned, it's located at the southeast corner with frontage on Sheffield and Addison. Uh, the length of the east elevation along Sheffield is 82 feet, eight inches. This is an increase in length from the 2013 proposal by approximately 13 feet. The south elevation along Addison is 199 feet and six inches, which is an increase in length of 23 feet from 2013. The narrow point of the triangle, which connects to the stadium on the west, is about eight and a half feet. The overall design of that facade is similar to what was previously approved in 2013. Uh, it is a contemporary design and it is clearly differentiated from the historic vocabulary of the stadium. An existing tile in Stucco Bay on the east end of the addition will remain, while other restored portions of the exterior wall will be visible from within the new space. Other contemporary additions have been constructed east of the addition, and the column, spandrel, and glass details are designed to match. Uh, here are a couple of other elevations showing the overall character of the, um, the east and west elevations of that triangle addition. Uh, historic preservation guidelines encourage the use of open and transparent storefronts whenever possible. As proposed, the four storefronts on the east elevation are proposed to be clear glass, although spandrel glass is proposed for the transom windows on the second floor to better screen mechanical and structural features. Seven of the first floor, floor, uh, first floor bays on the south elevation are shown as clear glass, while five of the bays at the east end of the second floor are clear glass with spandrel transoms. The remainder of the addition is proposed to utilize spandrel glass to provide visual security, to screen the elevator, to block views of the trash enclosures on the west, and to screen views of kitchen equipment on the second floor. Due to the size and shape, of the addition, internal circulation choices are limited and it was not possible to locate fixtures back from the glass walls. Additionally, the roof structure of the south portion of the addition descends into the kitchen space in order to lower that roof to better screen mechanical equipment. So spandrel glass is also used to create a consistent curtain wall treatment. The applicants have provided section drawings to illustrate those conditions. And uh, staff is recommending that review and approval of those spandrel materials uh, be provided uh, with the permit applications. So these elevation or these sections show the east-west section through that triangle building, and then the north-south through the narrower portion. Uh, and you can see um, how the interior circulation relates to the uh, exterior uh, curtain walls. And then here are some additional details. Uh, on the second floor of the east portion, there's a video board on the second floor and sort of a catwalk uh, that provides access to that space. Uh, the applicants have provided a number of renderings of the, uh, the proposed uh, construction. 
Uh, previously, the commission adopted a sign matrix for Wrigley Field, uh, defining the amount and type of signage permitted throughout the stadium. The matrix allows for 5,210 square feet of exterior signage for the mini triangle building. The current proposal includes 1,122 square feet of exterior signage. Proposed signage includes illuminated signs on the horizontal spandrels above the first and second floors, as well as illuminated blade signs oriented vertically at the steel piers. Two of these blade signs are shown in the rendering on the east elevation and eight on the south elevation. Additionally, there is signage proposed for the back of the video board on the second floor. Uh, the corner is shown as an illuminated club's insignia, while non-illuminated printed signage is proposed for the remainder of the video board. Based on the sign matrix, interior signage on non-historic features is not limited. Staff recommends that the overall size, materials, illumination, and type of signage proposed is in compliance with the signage matrix. Staff shall review and approve dimension details with all required sign permits. Uh, this next rendering uh, gives a little bit more of the sense of the building as seen uh, from Addison uh, looking north. And then there is an additional rendering uh, showing a little bit more clearly the scope of signage proposed for that south elevation. And then we have yet another rendering showing the um, sort of the narrow point of that triangle as it connects uh, to the main stadium. Uh, we are recommending approval of the project with the following conditions. Uh, one, that the proposed addition is approved as plans shown dated June 23rd, 2021. Two, that all proposed materials, colors, and finishes shall be continuation of those approved in previous phases of work, and staff shall review and approve all samples with the permit application. Three, all signage with dimension details shall be reviewed and approved by historic preservation staff prior to order and installation. And four, that the, all conditions of approval from the previous reviews of the overall master project uh, will continue to be applicable. Uh, that really concludes my presentation. I know that the uh, design team is um, participating in this meeting uh, and they uh, can address specific questions as well. If you have questions about my presentation, I'd be glad to take those now. Thank you, Larry. Um, Commissioners, do you have any questions for Larry at this moment? I do, Commissioner Osmond. Go ahead. Uh, Larry, when we talk, when you talk about the additions that we're adding 15 feet in one direction and 23 feet, that wasn't in the original project approved in 2013. Is there a reason for that expansion now? Yes, it, it's larger than what was approved in 2013. Um, and I believe that, that expansion is required to the use of that space, but I think that the architects can address those those needs uh, better than I can. So I I'll defer to them on that question. And I have one more question. That it sounds like um, even though to it looks um, very heavy on the signage, it kind of has the Times Square reminiscence to it. They are well below what was approved in terms of the signage um, uh, capacity there. That is right. So the cow has left the barn is what you're telling us. Well, I don't wanna say that, but I do wanna say that uh, Wrigley was, was guaranteed a certain amount of signage and there was a lot of negotiation that went into that. Um, and the sign matrix was the product of that negotiation. And so that, that kind of governs the discussions that we're having now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from the architects. Thank you, Commissioner Osman. Commissioners, do you have any additional questions for Larry at this moment? Mm -hmm. I don't see any hints. Um, so can we, uh, now we'd like to hear from the applicant and their representatives. Um, if necessary, we can call on others um, in the applicant's party, but at this time, can we please hear from um, the Cubs manager, um, Michael, uh, Michael Lufrano? Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Mike Lufrano, the Chicago Cubs, and, and Rick with me are uh, Rick Faywell from Gensler, who is our architect on the project, uh, Blake Milburn from Marquee Development, who's helping us develop the project, uh, and I 
can't actually see who else is on from our team, but there are others. I think Emily Ramsley is with us as well. Um, yeah, thank you for taking the time to, to look at the project. And I also want to thank Larry and, and Diana uh, and Alderman Tunney for their support of, of uh, this project. Um, this has, Larry hinted at it, but it's been a, an iteration of a number of different designs. Um, I know we're going to answer Commissioner Osmond's question in a minute, uh, but the original proposal was actually bigger than this, and we've cut it back significantly um, through discussions with, with uh, commission staff and also with the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service. Uh, as with most things Wrigley Field, this is an iteration and uh, continued part of the history and the future of the ballpark. Um, we are cognizant of our uh, recent designation as a national historic landmark, in addition to being a Chicago landmark, um, but also know that the building continues to operate and continues to have real challenges as we sit on a much smaller footprint uh, than, than most ballparks in Major League Baseball. And that balancing is what leads us to, to these discussions. Um, this, as Larry mentioned, at this location, there's been a bar and restaurant there since uh, 1990. It's come and gone uh, in other forms. Um, and, and this is simply the, the, uh, what we hope will be the actual construction uh, of something that had been on the books and, and talked about for many, many years. Um, it does help us expand our concourse. It gives additional space for fans to breathe. Um, both in the interior of the space and, and on the roof uh, terrace area, uh, which connects to our grandstand, which really uh, helps in what is otherwise a, a, crowd, a crowded ballpark. And this location, uh, to be honest, is one of the few into which we can expand. Um, if the commission remembers, if you looked at this ballpark before the renovation, this was the area where there were those uh, concrete panels sort of, sort of circa 1960, um, an area that uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know that it was part of the designation, um, but it was certainly something that uh, I re recollect from the conversations at the time, removing those panels um, was something that everybody agreed would be a, a positive step. Um, so we, we continue to uh, work to balance the interests of, of preservation and of our building, um, which we know is a treasure to the city um, with uh, continuing to make it an exciting destination for our fans and to be able to add amenities that allow them to continue to enjoy it. Uh, and that's why we're here today asking for your support of this building. We hope uh, you will find it acceptable and, and we look forward to moving forward um, with, with this new project. And uh, Rick, I guess I will defer to you again. I can't see who's actually on, but uh, to answer Commissioner Osmond's question about the, uh, the design and the size, and I know we've been through many different uh, 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 different steps to it. And, and this is where we had uh, uh, come out, not as big as we had hoped initially. Thank you, Mr. Lufrano. Um, Mr. Faywell, would you like to address the comments from Commissioner Osman? Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, I can. Uh, my name is Rick Faywell. I'm an architect with Gensler in the city of Chicago. And to, to answer, I'll try to be as, as simple and concise as possible, but I think the earlier um, footprint from 13 and 14 that was approved was, um, was based on a, a sort of an idea at the time of what would happen there in terms of entertainment uh, consistent with Wrigley Field. Times have changed, markets have changed, and the entertainment aspect of what has developed with a uh, partner in terms of the program was um, larger in, in, in many ways. And the other thing to remember too is a triangle is sort of a tough shape to work into. And so the, the mention previously of uh, by the uh, by Larry was about the kitchen and the food service and things. And just very simply, the program that we needed to support the entertainment aspect of the facility required back of house space and back of house space getting tucked into a triangle uh, is not necessarily the most functional. And, and as Michael alluded to, we had a much larger program and in, in, in discussions with um, uh, Landmark, uh, Larry and Deanna and others, we, uh, we made that smaller and NPS as well. We made that smaller and it's it's sort of pinched down as tightly as we could do it, uh, pulled back from the street. And we have essentially a two-story volume there with a large video board, uh, double curve. So it has an amazing uh, interior space, but quite simply, that's the reason why it's a little bit larger than the 2013-14 version is that First of all, it's based on an actual use and, and the reality of the programming in the back of house, which I don't think was anticipated uh, seven, eight years ago. Does that answer your question? 
Commissioner Osmond. Thank you, Mr. Fayol. Um, Commissioner. Yes, you... I should have said yes. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, you were on mute. We, um, I gathered that from the video. Um, Commissioner, do you have any additional questions for the project architect or Mrs. Mr. Lufrano? I have one uh, question. Just a curiosity on the um, um, setback on and Addison. You know whether um, it, have you? Is there? I'm sure there's other conversations happening with like planning and, and things. And it, you know, it just feels like it's pretty close to the street. And I just wonder uh, about you know with the the density that's occurring there. It doesn't feel like it's very walkable uh, where it used to be more open. You no, know, there seems to be some. Uh, there could be more open space. That was just, just a question on that. Uh, no, I appreciate the question, Commissioner. It's actually wider uh, now than it, it's ever been. It, those of us who are familiar with uh, the sidewalk on Addison know that there has always been a pinch point, uh, sort of middle of the block where the ballpark gets to its closest point on the curb where the sidewalk was, was really very narrow. Um, as part of this project, uh, you are correct, we've been talking with the city about widening the sidewalk there. Um, and, and Rick, correct me if I'm wrong, but the proposed plan would be set back 50 feet, six inches from Sheffield Avenue. Um, so that plaza remains uh, on the east end and uh, a minimum of 14 feet, 11 inches from Addison, um, wider obviously in, in uh, places as the uh, building gets uh, further back but at, at minimum 14 feet, 11 inches, which uh, for us would be a, a uh, big addition. Rick, did I have that number right? That's correct. And the other thing to mention is that we did in the final negotiation in terms of the footprint, we did go part of the way down Addison, then stepped stepped back where the entry is. If um, if you pull up the uh, elevations or the, or the perspective, the renderings, you'll see that we actually stepped back as we went west um, so that we could provide even more space at that point where it is uh, fairly narrow or in the ballpark, the curve of the ballpark. We were trying to expose the, as much of the curve of the ballpark as possible per the re uh, request from Landmarks and NPS. Um, thank you for those responses. Um, commissioners, any additional questions for Either Mr. Faywell or is it Mr. Lofrano? Um, I don't see any hands. Alderman Tooney, um, would you like to contribute to this discussion or make a statement? Thank you, commissioners. Um, while I have a letter of support um, on file for the project, um, I think there were some good points brought up that. I want to address as the alderman who was the alderman when we first landmarked this uh, stadium, I think it was 03, if I'm not mistaken, um, and have worked uh, tirelessly <laughs> trying to uh, is obviously uh, keep it landmarked, uh, landmarkable and uh, still be able to breathe new life into it for the next hundred years. Um, so I do support, and I want to thank the department for their help. Um, a couple of points though was brought up uh, one was the signage. Um, as was mentioned by staff, uh, the signage was an integral part of a revenue stream. Um, while I will say it, um, it was part of the negotiations and also part of the fact uh, that we were not going to do any um, taxpayer supported funding of the stadium. So we probably gave one of the more generous packages ever in the city's history uh, to provide an additional revenue stream without burdening the taxpayers. Um, and that each sign is gonna go through landmark um, review anyways. But as the report stated, this corner was gonna have, I think around 5,000 or at least could have. And uh, the numbers currently, I think are about 11 or 1200. So it's uh, as, Mr. Lofrano said the project is smaller than what they originally wanted, but uh, also it's probably less signage um, than um, I think um, I think is is positive for the community um, and the aesthetics on that corner. So 
The other question about the widening of the sidewalks, uh, especially on the Addison side, we are we have been working with the Department of Transportation and the Cubs in order to provide not only a protective barrier, uh, um, but also widening the, the sidewalk and, and uh, we'll be in that curb lane, I believe, to provide some from additional width on the Addison side. Um, so those were a couple of, of my perspectives on it. Um, the only, the only question that I has not addressed, and unfortunately I didn't ad address this with the Cubs in its um, prior to giving my support letter, but I think for the record, uh, while we're adding or not adding or replacing a food and beverage uh, facility, um, and again, it's interior to the building, but we do have a refuse problem uh, where the trash is and how the trash gets to, uh, delivered. And again, it's not, it's interior to the building and it will be something, but it is certainly a community concern and, uh, but not a landmark issue. But um, I've, I, I'm not going to forget that we we have a community problem and we're adding a bigger facility here with its own food and beverage. And uh, um, I don't know if, if our architect knows at all whether this is being addressed uh, not just since Gensler was the architect, I believe for the building. Um, is there a short comment you can make on that? I know I'm, I'm putting everybody a, a little surprise on this one, but uh, I, I would like to know, knowing that Wrigley has a logistics problem in terms of, of um, trash, uh, what, what, it, what in this project will help alleviate that issue? Um, if I may, the, um, the issue of trash, I think, is largely, as you said, is largely internal. We have an area for holding trash, and that will be uh, managed by our um, food and beverage provider. Uh, I don't think we intend to have anything on the outside of the building, so it shouldn't be an issue um, unless, you know, you're concerned about specifically when trash would move, you know, to to, you know, to be taken away and that type of thing. I don't know that we've completely figured well, that out exactly. Yeah, well, and again, it's, I don't wanna belabor this issue at, at this committee, but it is a community issue uh, that needs to be addressed. And um, we will work on that collectively uh, on this, but I did get a number of calls today, specifically with this meeting and the approval of this uh, expansion, which was more or less the expansion that we approved a, a number of years ago. Um, but um, we didn't address it then and we still need to address it. So uh, thank you. And it, this part of this, as far as Landmarks is concerned, has my support. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Alderman Tooney. Um, and just want to bring us back to the purview of this commission of this committee, um, which is the, regarding to the staff recommendations. Um, this project. So commissioners, do you have any additional points of discussion or um, comments or questions to either of the participants? Haven't seen none. Um, and being no further discussion, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the staff's the staff recommendations for this project. May I request the motion? Uh, thank you. Um, Commissioner Jakovic uh, has made the motion. Can I ask for a second motion? Second, yes. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes uh, has seconded the motion. And I'm going to take a vote on the motion. Commissioner Osman? Yes. Commissioner Ponce? Yes. Thank you. Uh, myself, Commissioner Aguirre, also vote. Uh, I vote yes. So the motion carries uh, unanimously. Um, thank you, um, Alderman Tooney. Thank you, Mr. Lufrano, um, Mr. Faywell, for being here with us today and um, expanding this discussion. Um, good luck with, with your project. Thank, thank you, commissioners. Uh, moving on to item number two, it's also um, in Alderman Tooney, Tooney's ward. 
Uh, it's 1045 West Oak Oakdale, um, Terracotta Road District. Um, I call Matt for this presentation. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, commissioners, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Um, 1054 West Oakdale is located on a corner lot in the Terracotta Road District. The district was designated in 2005 and it's really one of the smaller ones in the city. It really consists of four residential buildings, two coach houses and an ornamental terracotta wall. The houses were built by uh, executives from the Northwestern Terracotta Company, which was located a few blocks to the west. And this particular house was built by uh, Mr. Hottinger, who uh, was one of the founders of the company. The proposal before you includes limited exterior restoration, construction of a new two and one story addition at the rear of the house, and replacement of a one story frame garage from 2002 with a new one story masonry garage. As is standard, additions on corner properties are referred to your committee for review and decision. We've been working with the applicant since December on various iterations of this edition, and we have arrived at one that we feel that we can support and recommend to you. Next slide, please. Thank you. For orientation, this aerial shows the structures on the lot. So the Queen Anne style main house facing Oakdale was built in 1886. Behind it stands a brick and terracotta craftsman style coach house built in 1912. And then at the northeast corner of the property, there is a frame garage from around 2002. The restoration component of the project seeks to reverse inappropriate changes that were made prior to the landmark designation. What was an original open terrace above the porch was enclosed around 1969, and the applicant proposed to, to remove that enclosure or reopen the open terrace on the second floor above the porch with brick and terracotta. The artificial siding is also to be removed here and in other locations on the house. If original siding or scarring of original siding is found beneath that vinyl siding, staff recommends restoration or replacement in kind of whatever that material was. Should no original siding exist or, or evidence of that exist, staff supports the applicant's desire to use slate shingles to create wall texture in these locations, which is typical for the Queen Anne style of architecture. The applicant also wishes to do roughly the same thing at the stucco gable ends of the dormers of the coach house. And so they would like to use slate. Uh, staff recommends that uh, once they remove the stucco, if original siding um, or scarring of original siding is found beneath the stucco, we're recommending uh, restoration of that material if it can be restored or replacement in kind. Uh, should no evidence of the original siding be found, staff supports the applicant's desire to use slate shingle. In addition to this restoration, the applicant is also proposing two additions to the house. The larger of these is a two and one story addition extending from the rear of the house and connecting to a proposed new garage, which would be built adjacent to the coach house. Before I get into drawings, I just wanna show some of these locations. Um, the photo at left shows the north elevation of the house house from which the two-story addition will extend. Staff agrees that this elevation is the most appropriate location for a new addition as it is the least visible and the elevation with the least uh, architectural treatment. The photo at right is the garage that was built around 2002. A new masonry garage is proposed to be built in its place and the addition will connect to it via a one-story link. The other addition is going to be towards the front of the building um, and it is outlined in red. It is a projecting bay on the east elevation of the house where um, the applicant is proposing to extend the volume of this bay upward to create essentially a second floor. Uh, projecting bays like this that span multiple floors are a feature of Queen Anne style architecture and staff recommends that the shape and height of this addition 
would be compatible with the house. Get into the drawing. So what I'll show you is the existing on the left and the proposed uh, on the right. Um, so here we are at the first floor. Um, at the left, the existing condition, you can see that the there's a ample separation between the house and the coach house, which we uh, wanted to uh, preserve that view of um, the uh, elevation of the coach house, which is on the lower left of that left-hand image. Um, so the new, um, the new two-story rear addition is highlighted in yellow. It extends 13 feet from the rear of the house and maintains 15 feet of open space between the addition and the coach house. The new garage is shown in blue, will be largely screened by the coach house. And then the one-story link between the addition and the garage is shown in green. It is 15 feet wide and set back 44 feet from the sidewalk of the seminary. Here we are at the second floor, um, existing on the left, proposed on the right. Um, at this level, the project, the addition to the projecting bay comes into view and it's highlighted here in red. And then also at this uh, level, the second floor of the rear addition has a projecting bay over that one story link and that rear addition is highlighted in yellow. And so here's how things look in elevation, existing on the left, uh, west elevation and proposed on the right. Um, the uh, addition is highlighted in yellow. Um, you can see that it's uh, very uh, much trying to be compatible with the design of the house. The walls are proposed to be brick to match the existing house with punched window openings for clad with double hung windows. Uh, all of the windows on the house are to be replaced with that uh, type of window. Uh, which is appropriate. The addition is topped with a hip roof with a ridge and eave matching the gable at the front of the house in terms of heights. The one-story link is shown in green. It's a simple brick volume. Uh, it's 12 feet in height with a flat roof and a door opening. The new garage is screened from view. Um, the, at the bottom of the slide, there's a couple of wireframe axonometric views uh, showing the 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 addition and link from different perspectives on seminary. Moving to the front of the house, uh, facing Oakdale, uh, the second story addition to the bay is shaded in red. It's, uh, it's visible, but we feel it's compatible with the style of the house, which emphasizes Queen Anne style. Really emphasizes emphasizes a variety of forms. Um, a small portion of the new garage is shaded in blue. Uh, that is currently also visible, the new garage from 2002. It will be minimally visible uh, due to the great depth it is set back from, this, from the uh, sidewalk. And then uh, working around to the east elevation facing the neighboring property, uh, where both additions will be visible. Uh, this elevation is secondary as it does not face a street. However, the second floor of the addition um, at the bay will be visible from Oakdale as shown in the previous slide. And then finally, we'll work around to the least visible north elevation facing the alley. We see the new garage and behind the coach house, the uh, volume of the new addition uh, one other change which we feel is uh, appropriate is a new opening in the coach house at this alley elevation for a garage door. So staff recommends the approval, approval of this project with some conditions um, that are in your packet and outlined here, I'll just paraphrase. Um, we need uh, additional uh, notations on drawings in terms of materials. So. Um, that, that is something that we're going to be looking for. We, we need some more details and information on the windows and doors that are proposed for the uh, project. We're going to be looking for material samples. 
Um, again, an important uh, point is during the removal of the vinyl siding, any original cladding material or scarring indicating what that material was uh, needs to be either preserved or replaced in kind. Um, if no evidence of what was there was there historically, we are open to a slate shingle that the applicant wishes to use. Uh, we want to reiterate that there is there are art glass transoms on the house that need to be repaired and retained. And uh, finally, that the commission is taking no position regarding any zoning variance or adjustments that's needed for this project. Uh, Alderman Tunney is here and uh, representatives of the applicant are here, the owners of the property and their architect. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you, Matt. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Matt at this moment? Mm, I don't see any hands. Um, I don't see, okay. Um, so now we'd like to hear from the applicant and the representatives. Um, can we please hear at this time from the property owner, Jana Rubin? Yes, uh, I'm here, uh, Jonah Rubin. I have my wife here, uh, who is my co-owner, uh, Sarah Rubin of this property, as well as our architect is sitting right next to us. So if there's any questions, hopefully we can answer them. First, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank the Landmark, the Landmark Commission uh, for giving us the opportunity to present our, uh, our property today to everyone. I also would like to thank Mr. Crawford and Ms. Cuvallo for guiding us uh, through this property, through this uh, process, this beginning in December, as they mentioned till now, uh, they've been very helpful in terms of feedback uh, and uh, bringing us to where we are today. I would also like to thank Alderman Tunney, as well as, as, as his Chief of Staff, Bennett uh, Lawson, uh, for giving us encouragement along the way. And then finally, uh, the Central Lakeview neighbors who have also been encouraging uh, in our uh, attempts to renovate this property and bring it back to, uh, bring it back to what it uh, should be. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Crawford said, time has been unkind to our house that we have bought uh, with multiple renovations, which uh, do not reflect the originality of uh, Mr. Huber and Mr. Hottinger. Uh, we hope to bring this uh, property uh, back to uh, back to life. And, uh, and what I mean with that is the ultimately the glory days of this property. Unfortunately, we have there's no known record of anything uh, in terms of pictures uh, through the Chicago Historical Society as well as the building department, uh, any resources that we've looked to to tell us uh, where to go. So in terms of other renovations, in doing so, what we have done is, is that we have tried to uh, use uh, Huber as a, um, Huber's previous houses and other houses as a, um, as a guide, as well as what we have currently to, uh, to create a, to renovate into the, to renovate to what we think would have been the property at the time that it was built. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Ruben for being here. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for the property owner or their architect? I do have a question. Um, just what, out of curiosity, what is the um, increase on, on, on area, building area that these additions are bringing into this property? Let me, I'm going to hand you over to our architect. The increase. Um, thank you. Uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Oh, I'm Jerry Heyman. I'm the architect that's been working with the Rubens since they purchased. Thank the you. Uh, the increase in square footage is a little under 15% of the existing house size. And it's far smaller than what would be normal for a house on a property this size because the coach house square footage and the basement of the existing house count in the uh, square footage allowance. So we're increasing by a very small amount relative to the um, actual lot size. Thank you. Um... Commissioners, do you have any questions for property owners or the architect? Mm, okay. Um, Alderman Tooney, um, would you like to make a statement? I know you also submitted letters of support. Um, anything you would like to contribute to this discussion? Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman and members of this permit committee. And it's Alderman Tunney uh, for the record. So I, I will be in front of you probably <laughs> on many occasions in the future. Uh, regarding this project, uh, 
again, um, this, I want to thank the department because uh, this project is uh, smaller and, and more uh, in line with the, with the landmark uh, guidelines um, than was originally proposed. Um, it, is a, it is an addition, it's a corner lot. And I think as the architect said, uh, this is a, a large piece of property uh, on the corner. I, I would like the uh, architect to say, what is the, uh, the width and length so people can understand how wide and how uh, deep this lot is. Um, well, and then I will just say that, okay, uh, is that our architect? Yes, Jerry Heyman again. Uh, the property is 65 and a half feet wide and 122 and uh, feet, uh, nine inches deep. And it's quite a small house relative to that lot size. Well, and I and I, I do know that the elevations, both the primary uh, elevation is Oakdale. You know, it's on a corner lot, and we have really worked to try to uh, keep the structure within the confines of the original house. The, the, the breezeway is about the only thing that, you know, I think, um, you know, has been uh, an issue for, uh, I think our neighbor to the, uh, the Martins, I should say, the neighbor to these, but uh, we cut that, we cut this down quite a bit. So with that, I just wanted to uh, reaffirm my support and, and hopefully uh, our permit committee can get on with this and, uh, and um, appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions for either of the participants in today's discussion? Um, Commissioner Hughes, go ahead. Yes, sorry, I, I have a comment. Um, this, this house is really beautiful, first of all, <laughs> and congratulations um, on the undertaking and getting as far as you guys have. Um, I know, I'm, I'm confident that you're gonna, um, you know, choose the appropriate materials and, you know, the detailing as you continue the process um, with the staff. And I'm looking forward to seeing the finished product. Um, so again, great job and congratulations on such a beautiful property. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Um, commissioners, anyone else who would like to make a comment or ask a question? Uh, don't see any hints. Um, if there's no further discussion, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the staff recommendations for the project. Commissioner Osmond, I'm happy to make a motion to adopt the accommodations to the product. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Osmond has made a motion. Can I um, can I request the second motion? I'll second. second motion. Was that Commissioner Jakovic? Yes. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jakovic uh, has made a second motion. Um, now I would like to take a vote in, on the motion. Uh, Commissioner Ponce? Yes. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hughes. Yes. And myself, Commissioner Aguirre, uh, vote also yes. Um, the motion carries uh, unanimously. Uh, thank you, Alderman Tony, for joining us for two of these projects th today, this afternoon. And um, good luck, Mr. and Mrs. Rubin, with this project. Um, we look forward to seeing this um, really beautiful building. Um, and, and their further work. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we're moving on to item number three of our agenda, 1357 uh, North Elston um, on the 27th Ward, Mortal, Morton, Morton Salt Company Warehouse Complex. Um, and I would like to call Matt for this presentation. Thanks, Chairwin. Uh, Commissioners, as you know, the Morton Salt Complex on Elston Avenue was recently designated as a Chicago landmark. The owner of Blue Star Properties intends to re revitalize this industrial complex with a mix of entertainment and commercial uses. And uh, one of the office tenants that's going to be going back into this building is uh, the research and development unit of Morton Salt Company. 
So there's a continuity there. Um, and so in, in October of last year, I brought to this committee um, the, the project that the developer wants to undertake here, uh, which you approved, and you, but you did issue several conditions of approval. And one of these was related to the roof, so, the roof replacement, the roof um, surface that you see now, and it's beyond its useful life, and you re re approved its replacement. Um, but with that, um, your condition was that the painted sign on the west slope of the roof that you see here will be, will be uh, quote, replicated in its entirety, unquote. Um, so the applicant has begun submitting permits and we have a permit showing a rooftop sign that differs slightly from the existing sign. Uh, because this is not an exact replication, we're bringing it to the committee for review. Um, the existing painted sign is not original and historic photos indicate that it has evolved over time. So this is a view from 1938. It's a bit fuzzy. Um, this, uh, this time the building was eight years old. There's clearly a Morton Salt sign on the roof. Um, and interesting, it says Morton's Salt apostrophe S. It's all capital letters uh, and a sans serif font, kind of a modern font. And then it changed. Uh, this is from 1970, shows that the sign was repainted with the name Morton Salt without the apostrophe S um, in all cap letters, sans serif font. And uh, below this is the company's motto was added in this iteration of the sign that, that is the words, when it rains, it pours. Uh, also all caps in a modern block font. And then it changed again, um, probably based on historic aerial photos in the 1990s. Uh, and this is the current version of the sign. Um, the name Morton Salt was reduced in size to make room for the uh, Morton Salt girl. Uh, and the uh, fonts were changed um, to not all caps, and, uh, but also a very modern sensory font. And so here it, you're seeing the existing uh, from Google Earth compared to what is proposed. And uh, I almost approved this and it just something was bothering me about it. And you can see that the, the font is slightly different and Morton Salt is rendered in all caps. Um, and there are slight changes to how the uh, Morton Salt girl is rendered, for example, she has yellow hair instead of blue hair. Um, so the, the changes are font, capitalization, and some colors. But what's the same? The wording, the location, the overall size, color, proportion are all the same. Um, there's a couple reasons for why uh, the applicant is proposing the change. One is that the Morton Salt Company has recently, if you go to their website, you'll you'll see the company talking about how they've recently changed their logo, um, changed the font that's used to, uh, for, their, for, their, for their entire brand. Um, so that's one reason. And the other reason is to paint a sign like this on a roof, um, they need to create uh, large, very large stencils, which are cut uh, by CNC. And that CNC cutting requires a known font with like a specific digital geometry that you could put into the CNC to guide that cutting of the, of the, uh, of the stencil. And they, uh, Morton Salt has done research on the existing sign. They can't find any evidence of it, of that font being used in their archives. So as far as they could tell, it just was hand painted and so that's the other reason, using a known font uh, with a defined digital uh, geometry is, is guiding the replacement. Um, so that's, um, that's really it. If you wanna go to the next slide, uh, we recommend approval of the sign as proposed. Alderman Bennett, uh, sorry, Alderman Burnett was made aware of the proposal and he had, has not issued any comment. Um, Representatives are blue, of, from Blue Star, the owner, are here. Uh, should you have any questions for them, 
I'm also available for questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Matt. This, this were like really wonderful historic photographs. I appreciate them. Um, revisiting the graphic identity of this building. Um, Commissioner, do you have any questions for Matt at this moment? Um, I don't see any hands. Um, okay, so can we hear now please from um, the applicant and their representatives? Um, is the project developer, David, Dave, um, I'm gonna say this wrongly, I apologize, uh, Duterte. No problem. You you said it incorrectly, but it's Deuter. Deuter, thank I you. Hear it, I hear it. The, I hear it the way you pronounced it every day. <laughs> um, thank you very much um, for um, your consideration here today. Um, I think Matt has done a an exceptional job of kind of uh, not only um, working with us for the past year or so, but in also kind of uh, uncovering a great storyline um, to kind of support the evolution of this sign. Um, we uh, at Blue Star have worked hand in hand with the folks over at Morton Salt to come up with what uh, we believe is a, a thoughtful representation and a thoughtful replication of the sign. Um, though it's not exact, um, there is no there wasn't a requirement for it to be exact and the fact that it's being painted on a, a new roof that has a, you know, corrugated um, uh, um, condition to it as well, um, you know, tells that it's, it's actually being um, something that's being replicated on something that is in fact a different surface. Um, so um, I think it, it, it strikes a, a fabulous balance between, you know, the history of, of of the sign and where Morton stands with their current branding. And um, I think we're, we're really pleased with, uh, with particularly how it stands up on the side-by-side -side, um, comparison. So unless anybody has any further questions, um, I think that's where we leave it. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate um, the, the, that context. Um, commissioners, do you have any additional questions? or the project developer? Uh, Commissioner Hughes. So this new sign is mimicking the latest Morton Soft um, branding. Is, is that the understanding here? Commissioner, that's, that's correct. correct. Yeah, that's that's really, if you, if you, as I did a few weeks ago when this came across my desk, I went to Morton Salt's website and they're uh, making a big deal about this um, recent change to their to their logo and image, but also the fact that it's not a complete uh, do-over. It's really been inspired by um, the, the graphic tradition this company has, has had for many, many years. Um, I can actually show, I don't know, um, Joyce, if you could go back to one of the, uh, to the second to the last uh, slide. There you go. Um, so you can see that what the African has provided from Morton's archives are um, the previous logo on the right from 1968 and the, the font that we've used and then um, on the left is the most recent iteration of the Morton Salt Girl um, and the font of, the, of their brand name is changed from uh, to an actual known font. The company is slightly customized. Commissioner Hughes, um, does that answer your question? It does, thanks. Thank you, Matt. Um, commissioners, any additional comments, discussion points, questions, concerns? I 
I'm really enjoying this specific slide right now, seeing the, the evolution of this very graphic element. Um, well, if there's no other questions, um, I would like to request a motion to adopt, adopt the staff recommendations for this project. So moved. Commissioner Jakovic. Thank you, Commissioner Jakovic. Um, has made a motion. Can I, may I request a second motion? Second, Commissioner Ponce. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Uh, now she has um, made a, the second motion. Um, now I would like to take a vote on the motion. Commissioner Hughes. Yes. Commissioner um, Osman. Yes. And myself, Commissioner um, Aguirre also, um, I also vote yes, and the motion carries unanimously. Um, thank you so much, um, Matt, for the presentation. Um, and thank you, Mr. Um, can you pronounce your last name again for me, please? Sure, sure. as long as you don't ask me to pronounce your name. <laughs> it's Deuter, but thank you Deuter. very much. No, Deuter. Mr. Deuter, no, thank no you offense, so much. No offense taken. Thank you. I, I care deeply about that, so uh, I will not forget or hope not forget. Um, good luck. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Uh, we're moving to our fourth item in, um, in the agenda, 2107 um, North Cleveland, um, the 43rd Ward, uh, Mid North District. Uh, may I call, um, can I call Joyce for this presentation, please? Thank you, Chairwoman Aguirre. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the subject property is located mid block on Cleveland Avenue between a two story single family residence and a three story mixed use building. Uh, just some background information on the property. In September of 2020, the Department of Buildings issued an administrative order that determined that the building previously on the site was imminently dangerous and hazardous, and a, de a demolition permit was issued. Joyce, may I interrupt you? Sorry, is it possible to thank you to make the screen? Thank you. Sorry about okay. that. <laughs> Better visual. Sorry, there was a lot going on on that screen. Okay. After the demolition of the property, an ordinance was introduced in the City Council of Chicago that changed the zoning classification from a B32 community shopping district to an RS3 residential single unit detached house district. In May of this year, the applicant submitted a proposal for the new construction of a two story single family residence. I will begin describing the project with the site plan shown here on the slide. The proposed front yard setback for the new construction project is 14 foot three inches and the proposed side yard setback on the north elevation is three feet. The side yard setback on the south is one foot four inches. Staff recommends approval of the proposed front and side yard setbacks as the dimensions match the predominant setback patterns of the buildings contributing to the district's character. A one-story flat masonry garage is proposed at the rear of the lot with alley access. The two-car structure will have roof access to a roof deck. Um, can you go back a couple of slides, please? Yep, perfect, thanks. The proposed new building will be constructed of a mix of brown and red brick on all elevations with punched openings and a banded limestone base to reflect the typical masonry buildings of the Mid-North District. The windows are proposed to be two over two aluminum clad wood windows with limestone, limestone sills and hood, hoods. The proportions of the windows and spacing are compatible with the fenestration patterns of the adjacent historic buildings within the district which are tall and narrow in proportion. The porch and the stairs are proposed to be constructed out of limestone with a simply detailed ornamental metal handrail. The mansard roof is proposed to be clad with black slate roofing tiles. The rooftop enclosure extends three foot 10 inches above the parapet walls for a total height of 38 foot nine inches. The proportion that houses the stairs is set back 23 foot eight inches from the front facade. The portion that houses the mechanical room, which is highlighted in yellow on the elevation and in the roof plan, extends past the stair enclosure and is set back 20 foot 8 inches from the front facade. The commission has approved rooftop penthouses on new construction that are no larger than the required, that are no larger than required to provide rooftop access. No sufficient documentation has been provided by the applicant to confirm uh, the lack of visibility, therefore staff recommends the applicant relocate the mechanical room to the rear elevation of the penthouse to minimize views and maintain a consistent 23 foot eight setback from the front facade. 
or provide a 3D computer generated site study to accurately prove it, it will not be visible from the public right away. The rooftop enclosure is proposed to be clad in cement siding and staff recommends that the fiber cement siding have a smooth finish, maintain a four inch lap exposure and be of a neutral color to minimize visibility. Any rooftop features or plantings or landscapings on the roof deck should be set back and low in height as to not be visible from the public rights of way. The streetscape elevation and block plan shown here on the slide shows a variety of historic buildings throughout the district ranging in heights from two story to three and a half story structures. The design of the proposed new building, which is 34 foot 11 inches in height, exhibit, exhibits similar materials, massings, proportions, and expressions of the adjacent buildings on the block and is in keeping with the district. And finally, staff recommends approval of the proposal with the conditions mentioned in the presentation and also listed here on the slide. Alderman Smith and the Mid North Association have received drawings of the proposal for review. And this concludes my presentation. The architect and the owners are here if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Um, Commissioner, do you have any questions for Joyce at the moment? Joyce, just for context, this is the location of that building that was demolished, right? That's correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, commissioners, any questions for Joyce at this moment? I don't see any hands. Um, okay, now we would like to hear from the applicant and the representatives. If necessary, we can call on others and the applicants party, but at this time, can we please hear from the project architect, uh, Philip Casagrande? Yes, hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, um, you know, he's brought in on this project to work with uh, the owner, Felix, who purchased the property from the former owner. We understand there was an incident there with the previous owner and the building. So I wanna be sure it's understood that uh, he's a new owner of the property. And uh, we're a little surprised to hear today any objections about the two-story residential building um, because in the process of over the past several months of working uh, and being in communication with the alderman's office and the neighborhood group, we haven't heard any objections uh, other than from the immediate neighbor uh, to the north whose uh, consideration was given. And, you know, we worked through some design changes to um, satisfy their concerns and worked also in communication with the neighbor to the south. So uh, that was a little bit surprising to hear that there was some uh, suggestion that the original commercial building should be, or should have been rebuilt, uh, if you were. that The building, just for some additional context, was uh, the site was originally designated like the rest of the block as a uh, R4.5 zoning classification and was subsequently down zoned to RS3 zoning. Uh, which we are in compliance with. And uh, the, uh, the new owner was, was happy with that. The a part of the um, Secretary of the Interior Guidelines does state that the adjacent, the new, any new building should not exceed the height of any adjacent building. So we've adhered to that guideline. And um, you know, we've worked also with the landmarks very closely on making sure that the new building is designed and with materials, proportions, and um, a design which which fits in nicely with the neighborhood without standing out too much um, or being something of a a replication of what's there either. Uh, again, consistent with those guidelines. So. Um, I think um, that's, thank you. That's, that's it, unless you have any questions. 
happy to answer them. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, Commissioner, do you have any questions for Mr. Um, Casagrande? Mm, I see the owner is also present. Would you like to make a statement or are you? Yes, uh, so first of all, I just wanna thank everybody, uh, all the commissioners and everyone for giving us the opportunity to present our- All right, can home. you introduce yourself oh, yes. for the record? Uh, Sure, for the record, my name is Felix Vijaya. I'm the owner and applicant for, for this approval. Uh, like I said before, I just want to thank everybody for giving us the opportunity to present our property. This is our dream home. Um, my wife and I have been dreaming about building a house and also particularly, you know, building our family and growing our family here in Lincoln Park specifically. Uh, we have lived in the neighborhood for over seven years. We used to live in West Loop. Uh, but then since we had our daughter, uh, we wanted to move to uh, you know, a more neighborhoody area. So we chose Lincoln Park. Uh, my brother-in-law also used to own a restaurant called Rickshaw Republic. Um, and unfortunately due to COVID, he had to shut it down, but that restaurant uh, had been around for a few years as well. And so Lincoln Park is near and dear to me and my family. Um, and as Philip mentioned, uh, we did discuss our proposal uh, from the very beginning with a few folks, including Tom Moore, who is a, who's a prominent lawyer in, in this area, who happens to be part of Mid North uh, District as well. And we did talk to Arthur, who owned Carnival uh, Grocery, which is a building right next to this property, and also met a couple of times with Lewis and Sean Ingalls, who is the owner of the property north to our property, uh, with you know, essentially getting their support uh, additionally, like I said, we did met, meet and presented our project to Mid North Association and received uh, general support from Melissa. Um, and then last but not least, I just want to say that everyone's support uh, would mean the world for us, uh, particularly for me uh, as an immigrant to this wonderful country. Um, there's just no better joy than being able to build and own your own home. Um, so the support that we get from everyone uh, would help me and my family start to realize that dream. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that um, context. Um, Commissioner, do you have any questions for um, either the architect or the owner or Joyce, anyone participating in this discussion? Just a, just a quick question. Um, what are the particular, uh, uh, any particular uh, Part of the staff recommendation that you don't agree with or that you can just reiterate or maybe we can pull those up yeah to, to answer uh your question i would say there really is nothing that we don't disagree that we would disagree with that we are at odds with. Uh, it seems like the main consideration is regarding the penthouse and its visibility. We understand that uh, from having worked with Mid North and uh, the commission and the staff previously on projects. So we're currently um, in a phase of studying the, the penthouse to see what we can do to reduce its size. Uh, the intention was always to keep the materials as they've requested. I think we uh, just didn't put that material on our sample board uh, as it's something of a minor um, material and again, should not be really be visible from the street at all. So we understand that and uh, we'll work with them as we move into the permitting phase of the project to make sure uh, you know, they're satisfied that the penthouse will not be visible, so. Thank you. Okay, and thank you also for the opportunity to present the, the project. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Jaikovic. Um, if there's still other questions um, or further discussion, I would like to request um, a motion to adopt the staff recommendations for this project. So moved. So moved. Uh, Second. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Commissioner Jaikovic has made a motion. Uh, Commissioner Hughes has made the second motion. Um, I'm gonna take the vote now on the motion. Commissioner Osman. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Ponce. Yes. And myself, Commissioner Garrett, I also vote yes. The motion carries uh, unanimously. Um, 
thank you uh, both of you for being here today and thank you for um, working um, with our um, with our staff. Thank you. Good luck with the project. Um, thank you. And we are going to move to our last item of the agenda for today. 10 uh, 631 South Sealy and the Longwood Drive District. Um, that's a proposed new rear garage addition. And I would like to call Matt for this presentation. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, Commissioners, 10631 South Sealy Avenue is in the Longwood Drive District. Um, it's a narrow district, uh, approximately 12 blocks long. And it's unusual in Chicago and it has a bit of topography. Uh, it's built on a natural ridge and that is important to this, this actual proposal. The subject property is a two and a half story and basement single family residence built in 1925 in the colonial revival style. The proposal is to add an attached garage at the rear elevation that elevation is shown in the photo at right. Um, the district's gentle topography creates a downward slope at the rear of this house, which the applicant is leveraging to minimize the visibility of the garage addition. Um, because the garage addition will be visible, albeit minimally, it requires review uh, by your committee. So here's the map of the uh, Longwood Drive district that left showing the subject property's location within it. And a closer view at right showing the house's siding. Uh, it has a deep setback on a double lot, and that kind of reflects the suburban character of the Longwood Drive district. The proposed four car garage. So, on this side, the existing is on the left, and the proposed is on the right. Um, the proposed four car garage is a one story addition to the existing structure measuring 24 by 37 feet in plan. Uh, this slide shows the basement plan uh, with the proposed addition of the garage highlighted in yellow at right. Um, though this is uh, the basement level from the front of the house, the garage is accessible at the rear to the change in grade of the lot. An existing garage uh, indicated in blue will become storage and the door, the garage door opening will be infilled with painted brick to match the house. The uh, proposal is to utilize an existing curb cut and driveway uh, shown here to the south of the house uh, to access the, the new garage. Here's the first floor plan. Uh, existing and proposed. At this level, the flat roof of the garage shown in yellow will become a roof deck and access to that deck will be via a stairway, which is circled in red, which does project slightly from the house. Um, it, I believe this, and we'll show you, I believe this will be very minimally visible from the public way. Here is the proposed front elevation with that stairway circled again in red. Uh, the stair is with its parapet wall is six feet tall and five feet wide projecting from the house. Um, it will be 42 feet from the front of the house and the house itself is set back on the lot an additional 60 feet. So this, this addition will be approximately 102 feet from the sidewalk. Uh, at its closest point, a distance that will really minimize its visibility. And the photo at right illustrates the, the distance of that visible stair from the public way. Here's the garage shown on the north side elevation at left. Uh, the garage wall at this elevation also is six feet above grade. The walls will be painted um, brick to match the house. And the deck railing is a simple painted steel railing oblique or diagonal views towards the north side of the house at right show that the proposed addition will be minimally visible, which is so far set back from the sidewalk. Um, on this, here's the garage uh, shown at its south elevation at left. Um, the garage is gonna be set back 15 feet from the corner of the house, which is indicated in the uh, red line on the photograph. So with that setback and also with the change in grade, this elevation of the garage will not be visible from the public way. 
So to conclude, uh, staff recommends approval of this uh, garage addition as proposed. Uh, Alderman O'Shea has been notified of the project. He had no comment. And the Beverly Area Planning Association also has reviewed it and has no comment. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the team is here uh, representing the owner and uh, the architectural side. Um, thank you, Matt, for this presentation. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions for Matt at the moment? If I don't see any hands up. Um, now we would like to hear from the applicant and the representatives. Can we please hear from um, project developer, Kevin Klinger? Yes, hi. Um, my name is Kevin Klinger and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Uh, thank you. Would you like to provide like context or any additions to the presentation from Matt? Sure. Um, and I too, like everyone else, want to thank Matt uh, for his assistance. It's been very helpful. Um, uh, I actually live not too far from, from this um, location, this lot, and I'm friends with the homeowner um, and assisted them with figuring out a way to um, meet their needs in terms of uh, parking, um, garage uh, accessibility. The, the current situation is not easily accessible. Uh, you can have to do a 180 turn to get into it. Um, and also have some additional outdoor space that's more contiguous with the house um, and uh, not so deep with the grade change back there. Um, so very straightforward, uh, you know, just basically putting that at the back of the, the lot where garages are allowed for zoning. And uh, it, because of the topography change in the location of the house, um, it works very nicely to be hidden. Um, so you really won't see it from the street. Um, thank you, Mr. Klinger. Commissioners, do you have any questions for either Matt or um, the project developer? I do out of curiosity, when did you purchase this property? It's, it's a really unique. Uh, I think the homeowner might be on, but if she is not, I know she's got kids and dogs she's contending with. So um, I think they bought about a year and a half ago, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they've some done some interior renovation and, and have some long-term plans, but uh, it's a beautiful stretch of street. I don't know if you've ever been down there, but. Most people don't even know Beverly exists. You guys got to get down there if you haven't been. <laughs> it is a very interesting area. As Matt was showing the, the the side plan with the other properties and the Long Street. I yeah definitely gonna go and explore that area. Okay, enough of my curiosity. Um, I am here. I didn't realize how to access. Can you hear me? Hey, Maureen, can, we would can you hear like, you. Uh, oh. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, um, I'm Maureen Cooney. I am speaking for myself and my husband Sean Cooney. Um, we did have the uh, privilege of purchasing this home, I believe, last May, and um, we've just enjoyed our first year in the home and kind of jointly celebrated our baby's first birthday. So kind of special time for us. Um, this home is beautiful. It's historic, and we absolutely cherish all the um, um the unique qualities of it and absolutely want to maintain the, the beauty of the home. Um, like Kevin and Matt have noted um, due to the topography, it's really a unique property as well because we are from the front, it looks like just at a normal street, but the whole back is basically hidden. Um, and so we would obviously like to have um, the ability to put up the proposed garage. Um, the current is not to code, it's not safe. And just to have the garages, um, it was designed almost a hundred years ago. Um, it doesn't meet the current modern needs. I don't even know if our cars would fit in those doors anymore. Um, but yeah, to have a, an attached garage would be very helpful to um, making our property more functional. 
Um, and we also have just really enjoyed investing in, in this beautiful community and our home. So um, we wanna thank the commissioner and board members for hearing our case and um, look forward to an answer. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Cooney. Um, commissioners, um, last call for comments, questions, contributions to this project discussion. I don't see any hands. Okay, so um, is there no further discussion? I'd like to request a motion to adopt the staff recommendations for this project. So moved. Commissioner Jaikovic. Thank you, Commissioner Jaikovic um, has made a motion. I'll second it. Thank you, Commissioner Osman has made the second motion um, and I would like to take a vote on the motion. Commissioner Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Ponce. Yes. And myself, Commissioner Aguirre also vote, uh, I also vote yes. Um, the motion carries unanimously. Um, good luck. Enjoy that um, deck. It looks really yes. fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, and good luck completing this, this project and going through the rest of the process. Um, Thank you, everyone. Uh, that was the last Thank item. You. And Thanks. Have a good rest of your day. That was the last item of our agenda. Um, if there's no further business, and I'd like to request a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Osman. Uh, and uh, if everyone agrees, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, this is it for today. Commissioners, thank you so much for your service. Um, and we'll see you again in about a month. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day.